Number one was have something good to say. Number two was to say it well, sincerity, brevity, style, vocabulary. Here's one more on saying it well. Don't fail to say it. Practice every opportunity to say it. Practice every opportunity to speak, every opportunity to hold a conversation, every opportunity to give an invitation, every opportunity to conduct a meeting. Buy up every opportunity, every opportunity. Back in those early days, someone says, Mr. Rohn, will you? And I said, yes. I didn't even know what the deal was. I just said, yes. Will you talk? Will you talk to the people? Will you come talk to the kids? Will you? I said, yes, yes, yes. I need the practice, right? They need to hear what I've got to say, but I also need the practice. You know, when I used to unload on somebody back in those early days building my corporations, John says, how come you say this stuff so strong? I said, number one, you need to hear it. And number two, I need the practice. <laughs> Don't fail to say it. Jot this little phrase down. Actions are no substitute for words. Now, we've heard the other phrase, right? Words are no substitute for action. If you talk, 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 never act, I mean, that's not good. But it, let me tell you what else isn't good. To act, 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 never talk. Now, men have to work on this probably harder than women. Women seem to find it easier to put language to action. To give language more often, men seem to be a little more reserved when it comes to talking. But I'm telling you, you've got to learn to talk because we've got kids involved here. We've got family involved here. We've got enterprise involved here. Your living is partially determined by your ability to talk and use the language. So come on, men. We've got to get better at this. But we've all got to do that. Don't substitute action for words. It's okay to give someone flowers, but don't let flowers do all your talking. Here's why. Flowers have a limited vocabulary. <laughs> about the best flowers can manage is you remembered. That's about it. <laughs> telling you. Flowers don't say, you do incredible things to me. Nobody in this world affects me like you do. See, flowers talk, but they don't say that. That you've got to put in the little card. <laughs> the little card. And I'm telling you. And I'm here to also tell you, and you know it well, those words you put on the card will linger long after the flowers have faded and have been discarded. Someone may discard your flowers, but they won't discard your words if they were crafted with heart and soul. So, actions are no substitute for words. You've got to say it. The gift is not enough. Okay, here's number three. In good communication. Number one was have something good to say. Number two was say it well. Here's number three. Read your audience. This one is vitally important. When you get ready to talk, now you've got to read whoever you're talking to. If you're talking to a child, now you've got to search the face of the child to see if you're coming across well or not coming across well. You've got to look and see whether your words are having an effect or not having an effect. Should you back away? Should you come on a little stronger? That you can only tell by observing your audience. So, underline, learn to read your audience. It's so vitally important. I had to learn to read a public audience. When I first got started, I was so concerned with my notes that I think everybody could have left, right? And I'd have probably, you know, just, you know, kept right on going. Finally, I learned to look up and see what's happening. Look up and see what's happening. Are they getting it? Is it coming across? Is it registering? Should I make it a little softer? Should I back off? Is this the time to talk about this or could, should it be saved for another time? You've got to learn to read your audience. I remember when my audience started getting large, the first time I had 10,000. I wasn't the only speaker. Zig was there, and uh, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale was there, Paul Harvey was there, you know, and a few others were there. 10,000, my first big audience. And Zig said, Jim, you better watch everybody in the audience on this occasion. If He said, if this group turns on you, you're in trouble. I thought, <laughs> whoa, man, I'm, I'm searching the balconies. I'm, I'm watching the whole thing. But see... I'm asking you to do it. Now, at first, it might seem a little complicated, right? But after a while, it'll just come natural to lift up your eyes, to look at someone that you're talking to, the meeting, the invitation, whatever it is, one-on-one, -on -one, 
right? Give people the gift of attention and see if you can't figure out how you're coming across, how you might change your illustrations, your vocabulary. Okay, all of that comes from being able to read. Now, let me give you three ways to read. Number one, you read what you see. Body language, right, tells you something. A guy that's got his arms folded, chin tucked down, and he's frowning. I mean, you got your work cut out for you this time. I mean, this one isn't going to be easy. You've got to reach deep in your bag of stuff. So what tells you that? The, the, the body language, okay? Guy's leaning toward the door. You've got to hurry. I mean, <laughs> you haven't got long. Say it fast. Okay. So you read what you see. Now, here's number two. You got to read what you hear. Mama said to me, to be a good speaker, to be a good talker, good teacher, you got to be a good listener. To be a good parent, you got to be a good listener. You can't just do all the talking. You got to listen. You got to listen so that you can know whether or not to change subjects today. Save this for another time. This isn't it. What told you that? What you heard. Now, part of it's what you saw, but I'm telling you, part of it's what you hear. You've got to listen well to be able to translate well, to speak well, to edit what you're going to say. Maybe leave some out. Maybe add some you didn't intend to add simply because you picked up something you heard that gave you the signal that caused you now with your varied experience to not miss that signal, to cover something you should cover. It's very important to read your audience. One, what you see. Second, read what you hear. Here's number three. Read what you feel. Now, here's where, you know, the women probably are better at this than the men again, picking up those emotional signals. And you've got to remember this. We all throw off emotional signals, unseen, something you can't hear, something you can't see. It's just there, presence, aura. We've all got that. And you've got to be able to pick that up to know how to proceed, especially in communication. Women have it so well. Women seem to have this antenna <laughs> that picks up all this stuff. She says, it doesn't feel right. Man says, what does that mean? It doesn't feel right. <laughs> Looks right. No. It doesn't feel right. And men can develop it, though. I'm telling you, men, if you'll work on it, you can develop this ability to pick up these emotional signals so you don't go stomping on in with words, powerful words, when something should have told you about five minutes ago, this ain't the time. <laughs> so don't only let something strike your eyes. Don't just let something strike your ears. Let the something that's going on, let it strike your heart. Let it strike your soul, the emotions so that you can choose better words, choose the occasion, choose when to go, when to stop, when to start, when to proceed, and when not to proceed. This is vitally important. But women are good at this, especially danger. Nobody beats women on danger. I think it's because way back when, Papa was off providing, Mama was home protecting. That was it in those early days. So she developed this, I think, keen sense of danger, what's going on. Even stuff she couldn't see. She listened, yes. And she saw, yes. But I'm telling you, she developed this sense. Women are so good at that. In the middle of the night, the baby cries. Mama's awake. Papa sleeps. <laughs> Least little thing. Or in the middle of the night, she nudges him and says, go look, go look. Something isn't right. He says, no, everything's fine. I'm telling you. She says, no, go look. Something. He says, okay. So he gets out of bed, stumbles down the stairs. The front door's open. Now, how did she know? They just know. <laughs> I don't know how they know. They just know. But come on, man. We can get better at this because there's some conversations I'm telling you you shouldn't have today. Why? Something should have told you this isn't the time. Even with a child, you've got to pick that up. This is not the time. You know what you heard and you know what you saw, but I'm telling you, you've got to get more experienced also on what you feel to temper your language, a better choice of vocabulary, discarding one story for another. All of that feedback comes from this ability to read your audience. Now, here's the next part. Number four is intensity. 
the emotional content of what you say. Here's what's powerful, and this is good for your notes. Words loaded with emotion. That's what's powerful. A word is a word is a word. And yes, words have a certain effect, but words loaded with emotion have an incredible effect. A word might be like a little straight pin. You know, a guy buys a shirt, and it's got all these little pins in it. If I took one of those little straight pins and I threw it at you, and it hit you in the face or hit you in the hand, you'd feel it. That means I got you with my words. But what if I took that little straight pin and wired it to the end of an iron bar about that long? See, I can drive the pin right through your heart. So the little pin is the words and the emotion is the iron bar. Words loaded with emotion. Emotion totally changes the power of the word. Right. It's a lot different to read the word bastard in the dictionary and have somebody call you one. <laughs> What makes the difference? Here's the difference. The emotional intent. See, that changes everything. Now, here's what's important. You need the full range of emotions. All the way from love to hate. Sometimes you've got to put love and hate in the same sentence. What a mixture of emotions that is in the same sentence. Sometimes you've got to say to your children, I love you, but I hate what's going on. I love you, but I hate where you're going. I love you, but I hate what's happening. Boy, it's important for kids to know what? What we love and what? What we hate. The ancient prophet said you got to love good and hate evil. And sometimes you got to make it clear that you love good and hate evil. And when you define evil and define good, then you've got to sometimes call forth these extreme powerful emotions. God's got the same challenge. God says, I love you, but I hate your sinful way. I love you, but I hate what's happening and the road you've chosen. I don't hate you, but I hate what's happening. See, that's vitally important to make that distinction. And sometimes since my sinful ways are so interlocked with me personally, I think, well, God must hate me. And God says, no, let me make it clear one more time. I love you, but I hate what's happening. And I hate what you've chosen. I hate the track you're on. I hate what's developing. See, that's vitally important. So let's learn to put love and hate in the same sentence. Let's learn to define what we love and let's learn to define what we hate and let us not hesitate to say it because you can't tell who will be lost because it wasn't made clear. Somebody with a fuzzy response where it isn't clear, I'm telling you, they could choose the wrong path easy, be influenced by the wrong ideology easy. Let someone else influence them, right, that have got strong words to say. Remember, evil since it is the weaker, is the aggressor. You would think because it's the aggressor that it's, that it's the stronger, and the answer is no. Jot this down. Weeds are no match for human activity. But if you just stand still, how far in will the weeds move? They'll grow right up around your shoes. But if you get busy, are weeds a match for human activity? And the answer is no. You can kill them all. What power. Is health, is illness a match for health? And the answer is no. If you start health practices, illness is in trouble. I'm telling you, good is no, evil is no match for good. Ancient script says. Now, sometimes good sleeps and, you know, good takes a nap. And evil moves, moves in, moves in. But if good wakes up and flexes its muscle, evil says, my gosh, we, we may not be here long. I'm telling you. You have got to call up those emotions, good and evil, right and wrong, and make it clear. Our kids these days need the outer perimeters defined so that they know clearly from what we say and the way we say it and how we say it that it's clear what we're for and what we're against, what we like and what we don't like, what we consider good and what we consider evil. Now, yes, it's a lifetime study. And yes, we have to do it with great care, but I'm telling you, if you're so careful you don't do it at all, now all the dangers flow in and all the evils overcome. And not only is the world gripped in tyranny, but so is your heart and your soul and your future and your enterprise. So let us call up strong feelings as well as good words. Now here's the rest of it. 
The emotions must be measured. This is vitally important. You don't want too much emotion for a more casual occasion. Now you've ruined the deal. In leadership, we teach you don't shoot a cannon at a rabbit. <laughs> it's effective, but you've got no more rabbit. <laughs> One of my speaker friends told me not long ago, I said, Jim, you should have been there. The audience watched him, said, I blew him away. I said, no, where are they now? <laughs> you blew them away? No. We don't need to blow them away. Come on, too much firepower, okay? Sometimes kids have a legitimate beef of making what? Too big a deal out of a little deal. And parents always have to be careful of that, making too big a deal out of a little deal by putting too much emotion into, the, into a little deal. Because here's what you do. One, lose credibility. And also... If you let all the wild emotion go for something small, here's what you're then tempted to do. Now, when the occasion really calls for it, you, you exercise too little. So here's what's important to remember. Not too much and not too little emotion mixed with well-chosen words. Learn to measure those emotions. That's why we all appreciate the actor on the stage that learns how to mix in measured fashion the appropriate emotion that's called for mixed with hopefully a good script of well-written words. That's what makes a good performance. The right emotional content. Not too much. Not too little. That looks silly. Your idea falls flat in the occasion, you know, now is lost simply because you didn't have enough, but not too much to where you destroy the sense and destroy the dignity, destroy the opportunity. So this is some lessons to learn here. Well-chosen words, yes, but well-measured emotions. Intensity. One more thought now. What, are, what is intensity? Here's what intensity is. The emotional blend of all your experiences, what you've seen and what you've heard and what you've felt. We talked a little bit about that yesterday. Absorb it all. Gather it all up so that it's available. You may not use it all, certainly not all on every occasion, but it's available. The power is there. The emotion is there. It runs deep like an ocean. And the vocabulary is there, ready to serve you as an intellectual support system and as an emotional support system, ready to be drawn on. A little if a little is needed. A lot of a lot is needed. Key. In my public pronouncements and seminars, I'm a little more restrained than I am in private. I mean, in, in running companies and all, you know, you got to be there in the boardroom. See, see Jim Rohn in the business scene. Right here, I'm pretty reserved. There, I let it all hang out. Okay, so gather up your experiences like a commodity. Gather up your experiences like coin, like gold, like currency ready to be used when the occasion calls for it. Now, here's some more pieces to good communication. Number one, learn to identify. You've got to learn to identify with a wide range of people. If someone's like you, it's pretty easy to identify. If you're in sports and someone else is in sports, hey, you can build a bridge fairly quickly. If I'm a man, you're a man, hey, it wouldn't take us long to identify. But hey, what if I'm a man and you're a woman? I'm telling you, right away, we got some big differences. And if I don't accept this challenge of learning to identify with people, not just the people that are like me, but the people that are not like me, I'm telling you, I'm going to be missing a wide range of possibility here by neglecting to learn to identify with a wider range of people that have got experiences beyond my own. If the adult is 40 and the child is 12, I'm telling you, that's a long bridge to build of contact and communication. How can the person 40 affect the child that's 12? You've got to identify with the child that's 12 first to get their attention. And here's one of the best ways for your notes. Remember when you were 12. That's one of the best ways. Surely that wouldn't take much for you to recall when you were 12 if you're talking to a 12-year-old. I remember almost every day of being 12. 
One of the difficulties of being 12 is you're not 13. You're not a teenager yet. I couldn't wait to get out of 12. They said, no, of course you can't go. You're not a teenager. I thought, I'm stuck in 12. <laughs> you got to remember. You got to remember the hurt. You got to remember the occasion. Did you ever get chosen last in school? They're choosing up sides. And the leader says, I'll take you. And you're standing there. The other leader says, I'll take you. And you're standing there. The leader says, I'll take you. Standing there. The leader says, I'll take you. You're standing there. The last leader says, well, guess I'm going to have to take you. <laughs> Whoa. You got to go back. You got to remember. To build a bridge, you got to identify. Okay? You got to identify with whoever you're talking to, whether it's the audience or whether it's the person or whether it's the child or whether it's the adult or whether it's your customer or whether it's a client, or whether it's a prospect, whoever it is. First, you start the identification process. Now, here's number two. Learn to attack the problem without attacking the person. If you've got a problem to solve by communication, I'm telling you, this is one of the most important things to remember. It's not the person we're after. It's the problem we're after. What does the ancient phrase say? Don't throw the baby out with the bath water. If, 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 the, if the physician is too severe, he loses the patient going too severely after the disease. Yes, we must go after the disease. Yes, we must attack the problem, but not the person. Here's what you got to do. Leave a person with their dignity. Don't go after someone's dignity. That's not what's important. Yes, we've got to solve the problem. Yes, sometimes you got to talk strong. Yes, sometimes you really got to go after it, but you got to save the patient even though you're after the disease. We've got to do it with our children. You know, sure, you've got to go after your children, but not after them, per se. You've got to go after what's wrong. You've got to go after the problem. You've got to go after the difficulty. Key. Attack the problem, but not the person. Next. Deal in solutions. Yes, we've got to look back where the problem was. Yes, we've got to look at the present to see what the situation has resulted from past errors. But here's what you've got to do. Transport people into the future. We must get people to look back to see the errors that they've made. Yes, we must tell our kids at times, you have messed up. But here's the key. You can't leave them in the mess. Yes, you've made a mistake. But you can't leave a pe people with a broken heart because they've made a mistake now. You've got to repair that. Here's what the future can do. Repair all things. Rectify all things. Resurrect all possibilities. The possibility exists to change everything. Where? Not the past. And sometimes you can't even change very much in the present. But here's what you can always do. You can change anything in the future. The future has the ability to repair all challenges and all problems and all difficulties. The future has the ability to clean up all messes and rectify all errors. It is an unbelievable commodity. Reach into the past, yes, for some experience if you're covering the occasion. But now reach into the future. Transport people into the past and show them their evil ways and show them their mistakes. But also, like Star Trek, push the button and take them into the future. The solutions are where? In the future. Good health is where? In the future. If you haven't got good health, I mean, take heart. The future can repair all illness. The future can repair all ignorance. The future can repair all broken hearts. The future can repair all of this commodity and stuff is available in the future. So what you've got to learn to do, yes, is to cover people and their problems now, but take them into the future where the solutions lie and where the answers lie. That's what Mr. Shove had the ability to do for me, was to take me into the future and show me the solutions. Here's what he used to say. I can see you now. He told me in blunt terms where I was, but he had the, also the ability to say, I can see you in the future. So in working with people, here's the key. One, see them as they are. Then here's number two, see them better than they are and give them both visions. Give them a, your gift of ability to see both parts as they are and as they can become. Shof said, Mr. Owen, one of these days, these problems will be gone. I said, whoa, is that right? He said, yes, you'll have a bank full of money. I said, is that right? 
He said, yes, you're going to probably do so well in the future. When you walk in the bank to make a deposit, they'll all applaud. Here he comes again with another deposit. I thought, whoa. He gave me that confidence. I'm telling you, I borrowed $250 and got started in a little business he recommended, and I'm telling you, became a millionaire. A little bit of a start, but how come I went for the future? He had the ability to take me into the future and show me much better than I was. He said, one of these days, you'll walk into a room and everybody will say, that's him, that's him, that's the man himself. I thought, whoa, wouldn't that be something? You know, I said, you know, I walk in a room now and they say, who's he, who's he? Shope said, no, that's now, that's now. I'm telling you, the day will come when they will say, that's the man, and that'll be you. I thought, oh, wow. <laughs> You've got to do that with your children. Because I had that experience here yesterday. Guess what they said? Yesterday. That's him. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. Shelf's vision for me coming true. And he loaned me his vision until I could see it for myself. You've got to let your children borrow your vision. Yes, you've got to tell them as they are, but you've got to tell them much better than they are. Show them the solution. Show them the answer. Transport them into the future. Wow. Next is tools of last resort. Here's some things you don't want to use in communication unless there's no hope left. And the situation calls for it. Underline last resort. Here's number one, a direct attack. Usually if we're covering a problem, we use what we call the indirect method. You know, get on someone's case that isn't there between you and the person you're talking to because then you can really get on the case of the person that isn't there, but you let the person you're talking to listen in. Here's what we call it, third party. It is so valuable, third party. You say, Mary, if John was here, he would tell you the mistakes he made, and he said, ho-hum, and he's suffering the tragedy now, and if he was here, he'd confess and tell you that's what happened. But since, since he isn't here, let me tell you his story. And now, instead of going after Mary directly, I'm letting her listen in to an indirect story that I'm using as an illustration. It is so useful in handling children. It's so useful in working with people close around you. It's so useful. Third party. So here's the key. Get a lot of third party stories that you can call on so that you don't have to use this tool of last resort, a direct attack, until it's called for. Key phrase, the softer approach to start before you get to the severe approach that may be called for. But now, when the indirect approach won't work, now you've got to get right down to it. Now you can use as a tool of last, underline last, last, last resort, a direct attack. Shof took a while in talking about all kinds of things before we finally got to know each other fairly well, and then he went right after me and said, Mr. Rohn, it's not them, it's you. He didn't say, John kept saying it's them and them and them, and I said, no, John, it's you, you, you. Finally, he dispensed with all of that and said, it's not them, Mr. Rohn, it's... You, you're in charge of your own health. Society doesn't demand it. Where are you going to get the urge for good health unless you urge yourself? It's not them that's in charge of your paycheck. And now, see, up until I was 25, I would have sworn they were in charge of my paycheck. He said, no, you're in charge of your paycheck. You can become twice as valuable any time you want to, but if you're too lazy to take the classes and read the books and do the disciplines, then that's your fault. It's not society's fault, and it's not the union, and it's not the pay scale. It's you. Now, that's what we call a direct attack. But you've got to be very careful of a direct attack. Don't use it until last. Use the easy stuff first. Then, then, then. Okay, now here's the next one. Scolding. You've got to be very careful of scolding. Only use it as a last. And the reason is because scolding is usually loaded with insinuations. Somebody walks in late and you say, where have you been? Right in front of everybody to this person. Where have you been? See, that's loaded. That's loaded with insinuation. You don't care, right? You're implying a whole lot of stuff in a statement like that, especially if you did it in public. You've got to save that 
as a tool of last resort. Why? Because it's too loaded. Now, if it had been going on, going on, going on, and finally the occasion called for it, yes, finally you got to unload and say, hey, where have you been? See, you got to really believe in what you intend. Because if, if you don't intend, but it's too strong, see, then you've got to learn better than that. Now, if you intend to be strong, that's it. But if it turns out to be too strong and you didn't really intend it, You've got to learn, 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 learn. The lessons in dealing with children, the lessons in dealing with people all along the way, business, public, private, whatever, this is a good lesson to learn. Scolding as a tool of last resort. You've got to consider this with your children. Kids that get scolded all day, I'm telling you, they wind up with these psychic scars. It's too much. Scolding is like a cut, like a cut. And if you need to get somebody's attention so drastically that you've got to give them a little cut, now it'll heal, okay? And it'll be okay. But you don't cut, cut, cut every day, every day, every day. We would call that too severe if kids get cut and slashed and cut and slashed all day, every day. See, we would call that too much. In punishment, some things are too severe. In some countries, if you steal, they will cut off your hand. Guess what we say in a more civilized society? What? That's too severe. A little piece of the finger maybe, but you know, not the whole, not the whole hand. Now we must admit it is effective. You ask the guy, did you ever steal anything else? He says, are you kidding? One hand, one hand? No, never stole anything. But use it as a tool of last resort. See, if someone uses profanity all day, it loses its effect. Say, don't mind John, he's just a cusser, got a dirty mouth, we've all learned to get along with it. But see, if you don't use profanity, and then the day you let it fly, I'm telling you, the world will stop. <laughs> Say, whoa. If mama screams all day, see, it finally loses its effect. And kids even get used to it. Other kids come over to visit, and they say, don't mind mama, she's just a screamer. You know, she just screams all day, and we've learned to live with it. But see, it could have its dangerous implications. The three-year-old is headed for the street. Mama screams. Doesn't mean anything. The truck is coming. Disaster. Mama should have saved up her screams for the moment when it counted. Then when she lets it go, the world comes to a halt and says, whoa. Something must be drastically wrong. Mama doesn't usually scream. Tools of last resort. Now, here's one more. The more you care, the stronger you can be. This is so important. To let people know you care. It's got to show. Yes, it's got to feel, but it's also got to show that you truly care. And if you truly care, people will let you get on their case. They will let you give them terms in language that's strong and powerful if you really care. We don't mind somebody really going after us if we know they really do care. Parents, children don't even mind. If they know you care beyond belief, they will let you get on their case. But this is the key. The more you care, the stronger you can be. But you've got to care. I don't mind a minister consigning my soul to hell fire for my sinful ways. I don't mind that as long as he does it with tears and not with joy. <laughs> Wouldn't we all resist a dry-eyed sermon on hellfire? And the answer is yes. You can't preach a sermon on hellfire unless you sob your way through the sermon and the tears stream down your face. A dry-eyed sermon on hellfire, we would all dismiss as an ego performance. Your heart's got to break if you're going to preach hellfire. And the same is true with your children. There are some conversations you cannot have with your child unless your heart breaks and the tears flow. If your heart isn't going to break and if the tears aren't going to flow, best you postpone this conversation. Because it doesn't match. Strong words without a broken heart don't match. So work on that. Next, the art of persuasion. Let's cover this now, the notes under the art of persuasion. Just a little list for you to consider. Here's number one, become a good storyteller. 
Nothing more valuable than a story to illustrate a point, to cover a problem. Become a good storyteller. Be a collector of good stories. If you're talking to teenagers, you need a lot of teenager stories. If you're talking to women, you need stories that pertain to women. If you're talking to senior citizens, you need some senior citizen stories. You, you've got to have all kinds of stories. If you're talking to salespeople, you need some salespeople stories. If you're talking to mechanic, you need some mechanic stories, especially in your business when you're out there talking to people about opportunity. You've got to have stories that relate. I know a man. I know a woman. I know a child. I know a person. I know a person. Be a collector of stories and learn to tell them well. Well, In the South, I'm telling you, this is one of the key parts of Southern tradition is to become a good storyteller. But Jesus was a good storyteller. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like, how brilliant, how brilliant. He didn't say the kingdom of heaven is, that would have been too abstract. Who could have possibly understood how it is? But he related it to a human story. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a father with a family. It's like a bride and a bridegroom. It's like brothers. It's, you know, it's like people. It's like families. See, we can all understand that if you can relate it to us with a story. Jesus covered most of the issues of the day with stories. He told a story about the future. He said, when we get through fighting the devils, he told his disciples, and working hard, he said, in my father's house are many mansions. And he described them in detail. And I'm sure sometimes on a particularly bad day, they came back and said to him, would you tell us about them mansions one more time? <laughs> stories, people stories, situation stories, occasion stories. You've got to have a bag full of stories you can tell. Now, here's the last part of this. Learn to tell your own story. Sometimes you've got to reach into your own experience to use as the best illustration because that's what you feel strongest about, your own experiences. Now, sometimes an experience is hard to relate when it's just happened. Some of those that went through the Holocaust 50 years ago are just now being able to tell their story and relate it in public. And some of them have, haven't even told their own family some of the private things, the horrors they went through back there. But now they're able to tell the story. If you've been through a divorce, I'm telling you, it's hard to use it as an illustration right away. It's too, it cuts too deep and it's too strong. But finally, when it heals a little more, now you can reach back and use the mistakes you made or the occasion and make it useful information for somebody to grab a hold of and find value in it. So learn to tell your own story. Okay, one of the great apostles of the early Christian movement who was so powerful in relating his own story. When he talked to sinners, he easily related to sinners because guess what he claimed to be? Chief sinner. Do you think the chief sinner could talk to sinners? And the answer is all day long. He said, tell me about being a sinner. I got the number one plaque on the wall at home. Often he said, I remember the pit I came from. Yes, they call me apostle now, but I used to murder the Christians. I used to be in a pit so deep you wouldn't believe. It's a wonder God ever saw me. But I remember back then how it was and how I felt and murder in my heart and all the rest. You've got to be able to learn to recall your own life and your own experiences, both the triumph and the tragedy, both the difficulty and the opportunity both the stuff that was pleasant to the taste that gives me encouragement and also the stuff that alarms me because you use your own life as a good illustration. This is another good reason for your journal. Just jot down some key things about your own experiences. When I was young and when I was a teenager and when I got married and when I went through this and when I went through this and find that stuff useful when it comes to dealing with people's lives where you can reach back into your own experience and help people with something you've been through, came out on top or some deep, deep valleys you went through, sorrow beyond belief. Learn to do that. Tell your own story. Now, here's number two, and that's borrow from other people that have said it well. You know, I borrow everything I can borrow. I borrow from the Beatles. I borrow from the Bible. Some of the rock and roll lyrics are some of the best. Elton John sings, she lived her life like a candle in the wind never knowing who to cling to when the rains came down. Wow, you, you can't say how fragile life is and how brief it is much better than that. A candle in the wind. The language, the lyrics, the modern-day poets. 
One rock and roll song said a couple of decades ago, we're working on the mysteries without any clues. How well said of a generation. Mysteries and no clues. So be mindful of the lyrics, you know, borrow, borrow. Some people have said it so well. Winston Churchill said the truth is incontrovertible. Malice may attack it and ignorance may deride it, but in the end, there it is. See, that's well said. You could stay up all night and not think of that. <laughs> it's so well said. So borrow. In fact, I put a whole bunch of my stuff in a book called The Treasury of Quotes. You know, borrow these. Borrow the poetry. Shakespeare said it's not in the stars, for those that are so interested in the stars. It's in ourselves. It's where the problem lies. You got to borrow from the song, from the dialogue of the movie. Pay a little more attention. Make some notes. And borrow, borrow. When someone has a birthday, we usually go right to the store and start looking through the cards to see if somebody might have said it at the moment, have written it better than we could maybe compose it for ourselves. For a happy birthday, for a happy anniversary, or for some occasion, we borrow someone else's language. And that's useful, that's powerful. I do it all the time, and I'm asking you to do it. Have a repertoire of stuff that you borrow. But now here's my last point on that. Don't always borrow. <laughs> See if you can put it in your own language, especially those occasions that are vitally important. When my wife Judy and I parted, I was searching for the language. I finally wrote this little note. Dear Judy, as often as the night comes, so does my sadness. As constant as the day arrives, so is my love for you. I wish for you, and I wish the best for you. And I understand that dilemma. My life is here where you touched me. If ever you should call, I will be there to be touched again. It wasn't very long, but it was just a few words that helped to express what was going on in my heart and soul at that moment. So I'm asking you, don't always borrow, right? If you always borrow, you're a little lazy, right? See if you can't sit and ponder sometimes and craft the words that will be meaningful to your children, to your family, to the people around you, to your organization, to the people you care about. Okay. Next is straight talk. One of the effective skills in communication is straight talk. Especially these days, right? The next five years getting ready for the turn of the century, we've got to talk straight. The government's got to talk straight. Industry has to talk straight. I mean, we need to, in society, we need to talk straight to each other. In schools, we've got to talk straight. We've got to tell it like it is. You cannot make wise decisions by beating around the bush and going all around and trying with flowery language, right, to, you know, go through some ethereal exercise. I'm telling you, we need to hear it like it is. That's why Schof was so effective with me when I was 25 years old. He laid it on the line and told it like it was. And I'm asking you to be so minded, to level with your children, level with the people around you, level with people that you know are on the wrong road, level with people that have got a misconcept. Level with them to the best of your ability. Do it kindly and do it with heart and do it with spirit and do it with sincerity. But don't fail to do it. Talk straight. We need that this next five years. Or we will be confused walking into the 21st century with things unclear. Being able to debate the major life issues we talked about yesterday. Straight talk. Now here's the next one. Challenge. Everybody responds to a challenge from the least to the greatest. And here's one of the most magnificent challenges. This changed my life when I understood it in its full impact. Here's the greatest challenge. Let's go do it. Sometimes we're always saying, you go do it. You go do it. You get the job done. You know, you get up early. You stay up late. You burn the midnight oil for a while. You know, you call this spring and work around the clock for the next 90 days. You, you, you. Let me tell you what's more powerful. Let's go do it. It's more powerful when one member of the family says to the others, let's get healthy. Not you get healthy, not you exercise, not you should be jogging every morning and swimming in the pool, you know, running on the beach. Let's go run. Let's get smart. 
Let's build a library second to none. Let's learn some backup skills that'll serve us well in the 21st century. Let's, let's, let's. What a powerful challenge that is, let's. Let me give you the real impact of it. Here's what ancient script says. This is beyond my imagination, but let me give you as far as I can believe. Here's what it says for your notes. If two or three will agree on any common purpose, nothing is impossible. Now see, that's beyond almost the scope of my faith. About as far as I can believe is, if two or three agree on any common purpose, the most incredible things are possible. Now that, that's about as far as I can go, but here's what it says. We've always got to trust what it says if we can't see it all at the moment, and I'm willing to admit what I can't see. But here's what it says. If two or three agree on any one common purpose, blend their efforts together, nothing is impossible. The ancient Old Testament script says, one can become so powerful, he can put a thousand to flight. If two get together, they can put 10,000 to flight. Do you mean to tell me that the possibilities of power increases by 10 if two people get together? And the answer is yes. I mean, that boggles my imagination, but I'm telling you, I've seen it work. All of my partnerships around the world, uh, my businesses around the world are all partnerships, two, three, four, five. Why? Because it is so powerful. Did you ever see the movie The Sundance Kid? I'm telling you, when they fought some of those battles, they did them what? Back to back. I'll take care of this. You take care of that. I'll take care of this. If you're by yourself, you can't defend your back. Two or three. Jesus started with one, and that expanded to three and then to 12. The three were part of the 12. The one was part of the three. Then it expanded to 70. I'm telling you, made a massive effect on the known world for the last 2,000 years. It doesn't take that many. Just a few that are committed to a common purpose and get together and lock arms and says, let's go do it. Let's influence the industry. But it starts with two or three that are committed to a common purpose. And I'm asking you to cash in on that magic. You say, well, aren't partnerships a little tricky? Yes, like marriage, a little tricky. But would you discard the power and the influence for the nation and the world and the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world? Would you part with that power just because it's a little tricky? And the answer is no. Let us take on the complications. Why? Because its reach is so extensive. Let's take on the little complicated challenges that are created by a partnership. Why? Because the scope is so immense. The power is so unending. And the chain reaction can be so powerful for the future. So see if you can't lock arms with your family or lock arms with somebody and say, let's go do it. The last part is a passionate belief. Wherever that passionate belief might come from, for some it's a religious experience. A passionate belief in something. And it doesn't, have, doesn't mean you have to use that passionate belief on every occasion, just so it's there as an unbelievable support system. Some people have an experience that they call conversion from an old life to a new life. Ancient script even describes you can have such a conversion that old things pass away, everything becomes new. No longer are you the old person, you're a brand new person. There are so many occasions when you can be brand new. If it's the potential mother's first time, we got a new baby, but we also got a new mother, a brand new mother. Don't brand new mothers look incredible? Brand, they're brand new. Never been a mother. Brand new baby, brand new mother. And if it's the father's first time, we've got a brand new father. If it's the grandfather's first time, we've got a brand new grandfather. You should have seen me when my grandchildren were born. I was brand new. <laughs> With a blank page to start writing a brand new script as a grandfather. You can be born again when the sun comes up. A brand new day you haven't messed up yet. <laughs> All clean. Ready to put your imprint 
of heart and soul and language and vocabulary and experience onto a brand new page until the sun goes down. Wow. So I'm asking you with a passionate belief in something, let that serve you well. One of the greatest stories of persuasion using this, and I'll close with this story. The ancient script says, the king, Agrippa, was informed one day, oh king, you won't believe it, but we have the famous man himself in your dungeon. Agrippa, the king, said, you don't mean the man himself. The servant said, in your dungeon, sir. Agrippa said, I can't believe we got the man himself. He says, I got to see him, bring him to me. So they hauled Paul, the apostle of the Christians, out of the dungeon with the shackles on his feet and the chains on his hands and the smell of the dungeon, I'm sure, on his clothes and stood him in front of Agrippa. And Agrippa said, Paul, I can't believe you're here. <laughs> wow. And the scenario of both lives up until that incredible moment are unbelievable if you're a student of history. The apostle of the Christians and the king, Agrippa. Now meet. Agrippa says, Paul, I've got to know. What is going on here? What is this Christian thing? People willing to die for this movement that's happening, growing like a prairie fire. And your involvement in this. He said, y tell me your story. He shouldn't have asked. <laughs> Paul said, oh, king, let me tell you my story. He said, I used to kill the Christians. I had letters from your own government to kill everyone I could get my hands on. I was known as the murderer of the Christians. He said, when I came even near some village, a lot of people left town, went and hid, especially the Christians, knowing that I was coming to town. But he said, one day I heard about some Christians down in Damascus and I got some new letters of authority and I'm heading for Damascus. And there's a little line in the story that says he was breathing out threatenings and slaughter, which meant he felt rather strong about the project. <laughs> but on this occasion, headed for Damascus to kill more Christians, the good Lord in heaven looked down and saw this man, Saul. God must have said, I got to have this man. Nobody feels more passionately strong about his project than this guy Saul from Tarsus. I got to have him. And the story says, and according to his own relation of the story to the relating of the story to the king, he said, this great light shined out of heaven, knocked him flat, fell off his horse, ground his face in the dirt, and blinded him for three days. The good Lord using recruiting tools we can't use, but When you're Lord, I'm telling you, you can do it that way. It, it beats an ad in the local paper. <laughs> After three days of blindness, according to his own story, the great apostle said, I finally be decided to become a Christian. Changed my ways. And he said, yes, now, O king, I am a champion for the Christians because I'm a believer. And he related this incredible story. And just before he finished the story, um, the king thought, wow, this is incredible. And he did send him back to the dungeon, according to the story. But before he sent him back, here's what he said as a last phrase. He said, Paul, I must admit, you have almost persuaded me, the king, to be a Christian. So how powerful can communication become? I'm telling you, you can almost get the king. But here's how you get the king or have the possibility to get the king. You've got to be a strong believer. This passionate belief in something that fires up your soul every morning, that makes the blood run hot. For a genius, no hour is too early and no hour is too late and no detail is too small. The same is true with all people who passionately believe. There is no occasion that's uncomfortable. 
There is no occasion that's too little. There is no person that's too small. There is no detail too little to try to get done. There is no hour too early. Late means nothing to a person filled with passionate belief. And I'm asking you to call that up within yourself. And for a lot of you, you've had experience that have furnished this fuel. I'm just asking you to let it burn even more brightly as you go out there and touch people with words and communication and story and opportunity. And if what I've covered here has been helpful, I'm grateful.